Thank you for joining us tonight as we discuss wannabes and stolen valor on the Lessons of Vietnam show, watched all around the world. The Lessons of Vietnam show is broadcast from the studios of Nissan Communications, where they are gracious enough to give us the chance to tell the real story of the Vietnam War and those who served in Vietnam and those who served wherever they were located. I am your host, Bill Dixon, Vietnam veteran, 1967-1968 at Long Bend Post, which was about 20 miles north of Saigon. Uh, your participation and uh, in the show is always welcome and appreciated. Uh, tonight, as you can see there, if you want to call in and be part of the show, you can see all the good information there on the screen that's coming up. And uh, there we go. Uh, you can go to Skype, Computers 2K Voice, and type in uh, a name there and be part of the show, or you can dial 919-518-9773. As I said before, you are always uh, encouraged to call in, uh, give your 50 cents worth, uh, dollars worth, or whatever you'd like for it to be. But uh, always looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, we still have a problem with uh, veterans crisis and veterans uh, commit suicides and so forth. And that's, if you know a veteran out there or you're a veteran, there's some information that's uh, vital for you. Uh, please use it uh, out there. Let's uh, go out there and, and help the veterans uh, get through these times because it, be, it can be tough sometimes. Okay. Now, as we start our show tonight is, um, you can see there, I just, I just saw that last night, uh, late last night or early this morning, and I go, that's exactly what we're talking about. And as you can see there, once we were cussed, that don't want to be us. Sorry, no vacancies. What we talk about are wannabes. There's a lot of people out there today who claim to be Vietnam veterans. They want to be a Vietnam veteran. Uh, where were they when we were looking for them? Why? Why is there so many people claiming to Vietnam veterans? Where were they in the 60s? They could have gone in my place. I would have been, I, listen, my wife and I would have been very happy for them to say, well, Bill, we're going to take your place. Uh, I ended up joining the Army to beat the draft. All they had to do was say, yes, I'll serve my country. But they were too busy. I, listen, nothing irritates me more than a person says, well, I really wanted to go to Vietnam, but, yeah, okay. So. Wannabes and Stolen Valor. Uh, by the way, that good-looking uh, young soldier right there, uh, that is a proof that if you look at the, me in the picture and you look at me in that picture, you can. it's a proof that sea rations are fattening. Uh, that, that is me eating sea rations in 1967 Thanksgiving dinner as a boots-on-the-ground in-country Vietnam veteran who was told I should not wear my uniform on the trip home because of war protesters. I can't fathom why so many people today claim to be Vietnam veterans. I am proud of my service and serving my country and do it again. But sadly, those of us who served in Vietnam are portrayed as baby killers, psychos, drug addicts, and warmongers. For many years after, indeed, Hollywood carried on this myth in their movies involving Vietnam veterans. There was a, a group of, uh, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about in a couple of minutes, but it was a group of Vietnam, uh, supposedly, there was a group of people who claimed to be Vietnam veterans who came back and told about all the women and children we killed and so forth. Yes, there were situations like me lie, but I will guarantee you that there was more effort in Vietnam not to kill women and children than any other war before. What was the returning, why was the returning Vietnam veteran thought of and treated with hostilities and differences? By the way, the picture right there is one I like to call Walter Concrete. His middle name is Walter Concrete. He was, uh, uh, anti-war songs were very popular on the radio. The National Nightly News repeatedly reported the U.S. death toll that eventually rose above 58,000 men and women. Uh, the short snippets of TV of the war in Vietnam did not always give the full and accurate story. Every night at dinner, you had little short snippets of uh, the Vietnam War going on, but you couldn't really understand what was going on with that little short snippet, which is basically what they wanted to show you. After the Tet Offensive of 1968 and five years before that, the war ended for the United States. The most respected man on TV was CBS reporter Walter Cronkite, 
who declared that the war was unwinnable. That was after Tet. And uh, up to that, he had supported the war. Now, protests to end the war spits on U.S. soldiers returning from Vietnam. Now, I've heard uh, a lot of controversy whether we got spitted on and what we spitted on. <laughs> spit on or not spitted on. I wasn't spitted on because I might have been in jail today. But uh, there's a veteran coming home greeted by his family. As the war wore on, most people began to hate the war and became bitter and angry. They needed someone to blame and personally vent their anger. Returning servicemen were the scapegoat. The American public had a hard time separating the warrior from the war. Today, people says, well, you know, I support the, I support the soldier, but I don't support the war. I can't figure out how you did that. Uh, I'll do that because that one kind of tied in there. But there was always people coming home, and we were we represented the war to them, and that's why uh, quite often we received the hostilities, uh, plus all the bad things that the war protesters thing said about us. The Vietnam veteran turning from Vietnam was very different from the returning veterans of other wars, and this is why. Number one, the Vietnam veteran went over to Vietnam as an individual. And this is important uh, here that you Understand this, the Vietnam veteran went over to Vietnam as an individual, not assigned to a particular unit. They were, they may have been uh, 300 plus men or women on the plane that, that you get on to go to Vietnam, a country you don't know anything about. Uh, after arriving in country, they received to whatever uh, assignment to whatever unit or uh, replacement for the wounded, killed, or rotating home. In other words, while we, when we sent to Vietnam, we were replacing something that was somebody that was killed, or somebody that was wounded, or somebody had done their year and coming home. You didn't know who necessarily you were going to be assigned to until you got there at some place like 90 for placement, and then they were assigned. You were assigned to the unit and issued weapons or whatever it was that you needed. Where and as other wars, they trained as a units. They came went over as units individually uh, as a group. And you knew the guy next to you, and you knew what they were going to do, and so forth. Other wars, many women trained together and went off to war together and fought as a unit and returned as a unit. And there they are on the ship going over. Uh, they trained and so forth. That group happened to be coming home because the reason I know that, because that's the Japanese flag uh, there that everybody has signed. But they're coming home as a unit and having time to uh, kind of get over the war a little bit. After their 12 or 13 month tour, uh, the Marines were there for 13 months. Uh, they got on a plane with 300 plus men and women of whom they had never seen before, probably. Uh, the returning Vietnam veteran could be at home with a family within 48 hours and no readjustment time. You may not have noticed it, but young men, uh, especially uh, together, they have a very colorful language. You could be in the jungle fighting and have blood on your uniform. And for, within 48 hours, you have uh, said, Mom, please pass the blank of the blank potatoes. Uh, and you can fill in the blanks. But in uh, other wars, they had that 30 days or so on the ship to uh, kind of get together and get rid of the uh, some of the war stuff that you have to learn to uh, survive. Number four, Vietnam was the first televised war, so the American people thought they understood and knew about the war from the bits and slick pieces they saw in evening news. So many people thought they understood the war and everything is about it because they saw Walter Cronkite talking, talking about it night after night for the, with their, while they, they were done. Number five, the 60s was a period of great turbulence in the United States in general. Here, was the first American, here were the first American troops to have been viewed as losing a war. See, all the news got turned negative after Tet. We won Tet and lost the war there. As you can see there from the TV guy there, it said the Vietnam War is TV giving us the picture. And I can tell you unequivocally, no, there were not. Okay, not the true picture. Due to news reports and anti-war movements, Vietnam veterans were thought of as alcoholics, druggists, and psychotic killers. Even veterans of other wars looked at the Vietnam veteran differently. Often they did not want the Vietnam veterans as members of the organization. Such organizations as the VFW and American Legions uh, discouraged or just downright turned down membership for Vietnam veterans because even they looked at us as psychotic druggers uh, and alcoholics 
uh, who allowed us to turn at any time. Uh, of course, now today they're all looking forward to us because they needed members and so forth. And I'm a member of both organizations and serve uh, as, as a, a president of the American Legion. Welcome home parades. World, World War One. look at that parade. World War II, look at that parade. Gulf War, I remember standing in that parade and wishing those soldiers on. The Korean conflict home parade. Well, you see, there's nothing there. The Korean veterans came home and people ignored them totally. It's like they never left. They just, you know, uh, that, that's definitely the forgotten war. Just nobody paid any attention to it. And the Vietnam conflict. You notice the difference there? Korean conflict, the Vietnam conflict. We were not in an official war there. Uh, and you can see that kind of jagged uh, star there is because, well, there's a lot of things going on and a lot of uh, protests and so forth going on, but uh, no parade. Many Vietnam veterans blamed the anti-war movement for the chilly reception they got upon returning to the United States. They believed that it was not fair for anti-war protesters to question their actions during the war. After all, most protesters had not been to Vietnam. And I, I kind of edited the, uh, the word there uh, by the troops, okay? Um, uh, so you can kind of get the idea. Uh, no, gods, no, no, God, no gods, no country, no masters. In the eyes of the veteran, these protesters could not understand what the war had been like. In addition, many veterans throughout thought that the anti-movement should blame the government officials who had sent them to Vietnam because as soldiers, they had only followed orders. That was the thing called rules of engagement, how we fought the war and so forth. Uh, as I said before, I didn't particularly want to go. Uh, now that I have been, I'm glad I went. Uh, I'm proud of what I did, and I'd do it all over again, but I would uh, uh, like to see a little different outcome and a little bit way they fought the war. Even people who supported the American military involvement in Vietnam didn't always support the returning veterans. As we started coming home, the people who were going, yay, 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 kill the communists, uh, were out there, you know, uh, throwing stuff at us and calling us names and, and thinking we were psychotic and so forth. Huh? I'm not certain what that A and, uh, the A and E is. Uh, it, was one, it was one of the protest things, but I'm not certain what group or whatever, how it mentioned that. For many years after coming home, even Vietnam veterans did not claim to be Vietnam veterans. I know because I was one of them. They came home alone. Families were afraid or not really interested in asking questions. I think a lot of families were afraid to ask you a uh, the veteran coming home or didn't know what to ask. I mean, uh, uh, how many people did you kill while you were in Vietnam was not exactly uh, a good question to ask. Uh, so what, you know, what, what did you ask? So a lot of people just kind of ignored it and, and said, you know, just get over it. And I wish we could, uh, they came home alone. Families were afraid or not really interested in asking a question. If they did acknowledge they were Vietnam veterans, they were often treated with hostilities or ignored. Vietnam veteran was not something you could put on a resume. If you went back to school, the other students looked at you as the crazy one to stay away from. Mainly because one reason, because you were older, you may have been the same age, but if you went to Vietnam, you were older. Maybe not in years, but you were older. The Veterans Administration did not recognize how the war affected Vietnam veteran. So if you were a career soldier and you needed, uh, you reached out for help, your career was over. The VA was not set up to recognize or assist returning Vietnam veterans. Confronted with reactions of indifference, fear, or anger, sometimes veterans kept their wartime experiences to themselves. They refused to discuss Vietnam with anyone but other veterans. And quite often, we didn't even do that. Because how do we know they were veterans? Because they didn't tell you. It's only now that we wear the hats. And uh, I wear my hat uh, all, every day when I go someplace because it gives me a chance to meet other Vietnam veterans and say, welcome home and find out where, where they are. Uh, they refused to discuss Vietnam with anyone but other veterans because no one seemed to understand or even care. That's some Vietnam veterans getting together. And, um, and you can tell when a Vietnam veteran's telling a lie, though, because they said, uh, uh, this ain't no crap. Okay. And you know that, that, that they're stretching the truth a little bit there. Okay. 
The treatment when we returned home was about as traumatic as the war. Bob Green of Chicago Tribune asked in his newspaper column whether we, we had been spat upon when returning to the USA from Nam. He got more than 1,000 responses. He published a collection of those, soldier, uh, those stories in a book, Homecoming, When Soldiers Returned from Vietnam. You might want to go out and, and, and get that book. Uh, most of the stories received recount an event in an airport by hippies. For those of you who, know, who are too young to understand what a hippie is, that's a group of hippies right there. Uh, most of the short uh, are, are short. The stories are short and radiate emotion of that uh, that difficult time. Now, I'm not saying that hippies were short. I'm saying the stories in the book are, are short. So, uh, but that's the hippies. Uh, they would be at the uh, airports quite often. Uh, they would take uh, human waste and urine and put it in bags and throw it on us and call us baby killers and how many how many kids did you kill today and all that sort of stuff and. Uh, that's one of the reasons you were told not to wear a uniform. This is this is from a Vietnam veteran, and he says he was on page 63 of Bob Green's book there, Homecoming. No one spit on me. Instead, I was assaulted by kids my own age that were clear about wishing I had not lived to come home. Now, some of you out there are not going to believe this, but there were people who called the family of a, of a Vietnam veteran who was killed in Vietnam and would say something to the effect was, we're glad your soldier was killed. He deserved it. It's hard to believe, but that's what happened. Uh, I was assaulted by kids my own age that were clear about wishing I had not come, uh, lived to come home. I just found my copy of the book and reread the story. It was still painful. I remember that when I wrote it for Bob, I took out the violence I did to the guys who assaulted me. My story and all the others showed how crazy we all had become. Those of us served and those of us who hated us for serving. I survived, but the cost went on a, a lot longer than I should ha than it should have. Stories from other re uh, returning Vietnam vets. I came late to the war in early 1971 and returned that fall in a stretcher, non-combat injury. I went back in early 1972, sailing under the Golden Gate Bridge. From the bridge, anti-war protesters dumped garbage and red paint on our, on our ship. These as they were going back to Vietnam. But there were also a few small signs of support. When the war had finally ended, I came home in 1973. One of my childhood best friends said to me, I can't believe you went to Vietnam. I'm so disappointed in you. There has really never been anyone who asked me, what happened to you over there? What was it like? It's like having a whole year of your life that didn't exist. When you first got back, you don't think about it much. Then you begin to wonder why no one asked you the question. Then you begin to feel like maybe it isn't something you should talk about. The military brought you back to a military base. In my case, it was Travis Air Force Base, uh, and did not fly you to your hometown. If you had uh, had a long way to go home, you flew commercial or took a bus. If you wanted a discount on the ticket, you wore your uniform. In other words, if you wore a uniform, you could get a, uh, a discount on your bus ticket or a discount on your airline uh, flight when you flew standby. But at the same time, if you wore that uniform, you may be putting yourself uh in front of ridicule and protests and so forth. This particular guy says, I took a bus home and uh, to get a cheaper ticket. I wore my uniform. That night in a bus station, I was sitting at the lunch counter and, the, and three guys my age, but obviously not in the military, kept looking at me and laughing. They made some comments, but I tried to ignore them. When I got up to leave, one of them gave me the bird. I motioned them to follow me and I went to the bathroom intending on doing all the violence I could uh, to them before I took a beat down from them. Now, this particular story, I happen to know, because uh, uh, when, when I researched this story, uh, that was the uh, Raleigh, Raleigh bus station, uh, which is surprising because there wasn't a whole lot of protests in downtown Raleigh at that time. But they didn't follow. When I came out of the restroom, they had left. I returned to the restroom, changed out of my uniform, and never wore it again on the bus trip. 
After I left the military, I denied having gone to Vietnam for years. Because when someone asked you if you said yes, you were likely to get a lecture on participating in unjust war, and it was hard to argue back when you felt that war was unjust also, but you had participated anyway. See, part of the things that was going on back in those days was the civil rights movement. You see the man there holding the uh, Keep Alabama White. You see the young lady there who's uh, taking her bra off and was wanting to talk about burning the bra for women's rights and um, make love, not war. Uh, that was the reason to be a protester right there, make love, not war. You know, get high on drugs and make love and don't go to war. But that was a uh, lot of what was going on and so forth, why we couldn't talk about it. A friend of mine that, like most of us uh, who uh, arrived at Travis Air Force Base in California, uh, then took a flight out of San Francisco. After the plane took off, the flight attendant came by and asked, where are you going? His response was, home. Her response, where have you been? His response, Vietnam. Her response was, why don't you go back there? We don't want you here. And she refused to serve him for the entire trip. And uh, I put that picture down on the bottom of the airplane because most of us flew from Vietnam or to Vietnam or from Vietnam with Braniff Airlines, and they always had these wild painted uh, airplanes. But uh, so even on the planes, you had to, uh, you couldn't hardly tell. But it's kind of hard, you know, in January, you got a, a short haircut and a nice brown tan uh, for them not to know that you were from coming home from Vietnam, especially if you're going to Pennsylvania or someplace. My, my trip home, my trip home in 1968 was pretty tame. I pro processed out of Travis uh, Air Force Base, caught a cab to San Francisco, which is basically going across the bridge. The short ride, it cost me, this was around 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. It still cost me $50. That was in 68. In uniform for the discount, it did not really have anything to change into. So I had to get my airline ticket and so forth uh, in the uniform. I caught a flight from about one o'clock to Dallas, and then I flew from Dallas to Chicago, and from Chicago to Atlanta, and then to home, Raleigh Durham Airport. Now you can see that I was kind of zigzagging, but every time I got there, the plane didn't have a direct route, so uh, I kept I just keep me going in that direction. Uh, my wife met me at the airport, and then I had thirty days leave before reporting to Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, we visited family and. Some of the family didn't even act like they even knew I was gone for a year. It's like, oh, you've been gone? And uh, not let on uh, that I was in Vietnam or even ask a question and so forth. But uh, that's actually Rotterdam Airport in the 60s. That is not my wife and I, but that is uh, Rotterdam Airport in the 60s where you could walk right out to the airplane. Uh, in fact, the only way you got on the airplane was walk up the steps there. Now, Fort Hood, Texas. One of the reasons I didn't experience some of the stuff that other veterans uh, coming back, uh, the ones who caught the uh, most crap, excuse my French there, uh, were getting out and went out in the civilian world. But I was still in the military, uh, not looking for a job, so I didn't have to worry about filling out a resume. Uh, I was not doing a lot of uh, interacting with the public. I experienced no recognizable bad treatment from being uh, a Vietnam veteran because most of them didn't know I was a Vietnam veteran. Because I was surrounded by other Vietnam veterans, I stayed away from I stayed away from Killeen, Texas. I lived in a little place called uh, uh, Copper's Cove on the other side of Killeen, uh, Fort Hood. Fort Hood was a, a huge military base for the First Armored Division, and uh, we lived in a small community of uh, Copper's Cove on the other side of the base, uh, where uh, they treated soldiers like soldiers. Uh, Killeen, Texas, was a lot of like uh, Fedval, or we used to call it Vietnam. In Hay Street, you could uh, you could buy anything you want to, and you get your throat cut on payday. Fort Hood has so many Vietnam veterans; they hardly knew what to do with us, especially E5s and above ranks. I pulled I pulled CQ charge of quarters one night uh, the year I was there because they had so many of us. When I left Fort Hood as a civilian, I never talked about Vietnam or being a Vietnam veteran for more than 20 years. I came home and just didn't tell anybody; just went on with my life. This brings us to the question with the way we were treated when we come home. Why should anyone want to be a wannabe? This is a great book. Uh, I highly recommend you get it. It's by Jerk Burkett or J.G. Burkett out of Texas. And it's a fantastic book uh, to read about uh, some of the soul and valor. 
Uh, he got tired of people claiming to be uh, veterans that won't veterans. He wrote the book. And the United States government added to the uh, situation by introducing the term Vietnam era veteran as well as Vietnam veteran. The reason they did that was because if you were a Vietnam veteran, you were probably subject to uh, Agent Orange, the were they poisonous, where if you were a Vietnam era veteran, you may have been in the military, but you were not necessarily in Vietnam. So to distinguish that, they came up with the idea of Vietnam era veteran. Uh, I've never heard of a Korean air veteran or World War II air veteran. Uh, if you were in, if you were in the military in World War II, you were a World War II veteran, whether you ever went there or not. Uh, during the time of the Vietnam War, approximately nine million men and women served in the military. Of that nine million, a little less than three million actually served in Vietnam. As we say, boots on the ground. The six million who served our country, it was just their luck of the draw. How did they get not get chosen to Vietnam? I don't know. Maybe they had a friend that was a company clerk or whatever, but they never had to go to Vietnam. And I don't look back, I look bad at them because they served the country during that period of time. But I do uh, think a boots on the ground veteran is a real Vietnam veteran. Uh, I don't like talking to a guy who's got a Vietnam veteran hat on and find out that he never went to Vietnam. Uh, there are hats out there called Vietnam era veteran. And I do appreciate their service just as much as anybody else. But uh, those 6 million veterans service, but feel they are not Vietnam veterans. As I just got through saying, nothing against them whatsoever. I would have liked to have been one of those. But unfortunately, the, they didn't ask me. In fact, I joined the Army to go to Germany. I hadn't been there yet. They sent me to Vietnam instead. And I think there's a little bit of difference in the two. But I highly recommend you getting Jug Burkett's book there. The United States Census, 9, 2010. The last census reported 13 plus million Vietnam veterans. Now, remember what I just said? Let's see, 3 million people, a little less than 3 million of us actually served in Vietnam. But it's 13 million veterans. And if you go this way, 9 million people served during that period of time. So 9 from uh, 3 is 6 million. But it's 13 million veterans. Uh, somebody's telling a lie somewhere along the line. Uh, I, you know, I don't know exactly who they are out there. And here's a joke that goes around here. Uh, in all the Vietnam War, there was 260 Navy SEALs served. Of those 260, 1,200 of them live right here in the Raleigh, North Carolina Triangle area. Now, if you're Marines, let me read this to you again. In all the Vietnam War, 260 Navy SEALs served. Of those, 1,200 of them live right here in the Rotter Durham, uh, uh, Carolina Triangle area. Uh, I, think about that for a little while. Maybe, so maybe sometime tonight you'll wake up and go, oh, okay. Uh, okay. The Stolen Valor Act of 2005, there got to be such a, a problem with wannabes and so forth that uh, someone uh, got together. Let's have a, we need, a, you know, there ought to be a law against that. So somebody said, well, let's make one. Stolen Valor Act of 2005. The Stolen Valor Act of 2005, signed into law by President George W. Bush on December 20th, 2006, which doesn't make any sense itself. It's the Stolen Valor Act of 2005, but he didn't sign it until 2006, a year later. Why wouldn't it be the 2006 Valor Act? Oh, well, I'm not big on uh, government stuff anyway. Why was a U.S. Why was a U.S. law that broad, broadened the provisions of previously U.S. laws addressing the unauthorized wear, manufacture, or sale of any military decorations and medals? The law made it a federal misdemeanor to falsely represent oneself as having received any U.S. military decorations or medals. If convicted, defendants might have been imprisoned for up to six months unless the decoration, decoration lied about its Medal of Honor, in which case imprisonment could have been up to one year. They, got real, they get real serious about the Medal of Honor, which they should. The United States versus Alvarez, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on June 28, 2012, that the Stolen Valor Act was unconstitutional, abridgment of the freedom of speech under the First Amendment, striking down the law in a 6-3 decision. Okay. Uh, it may be unconstitutional to abridge the freedom of speech 
but I have a feeling a lot of people who claim to be Vietnam veterans around the wrong people, uh, those people didn't worry about whether they were infringing upon their uh, free speech. The Stolen Violent Act of 2013, House Resolution 25-258. Fake Warriors, another good book out there, second edition. It was so good that people bought us, uh, had to reprint. Henry Mark Holzer and Erica Holzer. Uh, the Stolen Vata Act 2013 is a United States federal law that was passed by the 113th United States Congress. The law amends a federal criminal code to make it a crime for a person to fraudulently claim they have uh, having received a Vata award specifically specified in the act with the in intention of obtaining money property or other tangible benefits by convincing another that he or she received the award. In other words, if you go out there, you go out there and you find a guy that has got a uniform that he can't hard, he don't even want to be in a lightning storm because the lightning is striking, he'd burn to death with so many medals and so forth. As long as he uh, finds somebody stupid enough to believe he was a veteran, uh, he can get by with it. The only thing this law touches are people who use their uh, Vietnam veteranish ship uh, for, to, re to receive a award or special dispensation and so forth. The, kernel, uh, the current federal law is a revised version of a previous statute struck down by the Supreme Court of the United States in United States versus Alvarez. In Alvarez, the Supreme Court ruled the arrest and prosecution of a citizen for wearing unarmed, earn, earn military awards who did so with, without criminal intent, violated their constitutional rights or freedom of speech. Hey, what's the big deal? Nobody gets hurt. Those fakes are just trying to uh, make them, uh, themselves special. How would you feel if you went out and bought some fake Super Bowl tickets and you went to the Super Bowl? How would you like to have a genuine fake watch? You know, a Dolex or, or something instead of Rolex. Uh, fake news. Uh, we've heard all that lately. How would you like to have a couple hundred thousand worth of uh, fake dollar bills or the fake book. Uh, yes, there is, there is, uh, there, th there are repercussions about being fake. These fakes are just uh, trying to make themselves special. Now, what's that ribbon on the left? It's my award for stolen valor. You can see that guy has got a uh, ribbon on his, on his, over his shoulder and he's got um, all kinds of ribbons and so forth. I can't even tell what all of them are. Quite often, that's a Marine, but they, they wear Air Force and Navy, and of course, they're part of the Navy, but Air Force and Army medals and so forth, because most people don't know the difference. When someone claims to have been honorably engaged in something such as the Vietnam War, and they did not participate in any manner, that is stolen valor. Many of our friends did come home. They never had the opportunity, did not come home. They never had the opportunity to have a family career. They gave their, they have everything there is to give for us, their life. This guy is claiming to be something special, just like these people who gave everything in their families. Most of the men and women left behind a mother, father, sister, brother, girl, or boyfriend, or wife, or husband. Even those of us fortunate to have come home, the war is still in our minds and dreams every day. How can one and say? Stolen valor is, is no big deal. The fakes are making a mockery of the real sacrifice of those who served us to make us safe and have the freedom we enjoy. Now, there is uh, another book by Gary uh, Kulik. Uh, I'm not going to mention the guy whose picture is on the cover there because uh, I don't want to get political, uh, but his name is John. Uh, most war veterans are quite unassuming people, but the fake veterans make up wild, fantastic stories to bring glory and admiration to themselves. Between the war protesters, news media, and fakes, the American people got an unrealistic view of the war and the warriors. A group of purported Vietnam veterans testified before Congress to all the terrible things the American military were doing in Vietnam to its, to its population. These Veterans, I use the word loosely, were pre -test were pre testimony coached, and the majority of them have never been to Vietnam, but they were testifying before Congress as Vietnam veterans with the um, uh, aid of the uh, two of the men there in that picture. 
The news media didn't seem to care one way or the other whether they were Vietnam vets or telling their real story. Uh, one of those guys in that picture is a almost Vietnam vet. He was there. Okay. Over the years, I've spoken to many, many high school groups. I like to visit as little with the students prior to my uh, talking to them about Vietnam. This gives me an idea of what they are, uh, where they are in their Vietnam knowledge, because I have to train my uh, talking so they're not totally out of the picture a little bit. So if the teachers told them a little bit about Vietnam, it helps. One day, several students who were really excited to speak, uh, who speak to me prior to class. And the first question they asked was, how many Vietnamese did I, did I skin and eat while in Vietnam? Didn't exactly how to answer that when I, you know, I've had, uh, how many did you kill? But I never had any skin and eat before. And my answer after I finally got my composure was none. And anyone who said they did is sick and a liar. This is a form of sick, deprived, stolen valor that gives a real distorted view from the public of, public of Vietnam veterans. A claiming to be a Vietnam veteran, we have the course we've talked about where the name of the show came from, Lessons of Vietnam. And we go into schools and speak, and the teachers don't always know uh, what's a Vietnam veteran or not a Vietnam veteran. So uh, the week before I went and spoke to this class, uh, a person was in there and talked about killing and skinning and eating the Vietnamese. Uh, he probably couldn't find Vietnam on the map, but uh, he was telling all these wild stories. And if you just waddle the story, the more, sometimes more of the people want to believe it. What harm do people who fake military services actually cause? Dan Rosenthal, imagery. And I do not remember right now what RSTA is. If you know me, call me and tell me or whatever. Uh, he's a veteran. And this is, uh, I'm going to approach this from a slightly different perspective than other answers, which rightly point out there is harm in the fraudulent act of seeking free stuff or greater weight of authority and so forth. This is all certainly true, but there's another kind of fraud stemming from stolen battle. It's far more serious and far, far more dangerous. It's extremely common for fraudulent vets to tell stories of their fictional service that due to the extra weight of authority and perceived experiences of the storyteller's military expense are taken as a gospel truth. In other words, people don't know the difference, they believe it. These stories then become part of a fictional public perception of what the military is, how it works, how soldiers operate, how they feel and how they act, what they experience and so forth. Right now, we're going through an upheaval in this country. There is an, uh, especially here in the South where people are wanting to have uh, Vietnam Memorial, excuse me, uh, Civil War Memorials. I'm not going to get into uh, whether you want to all up move or what not move. Uh, my personal thing is that uh, you need to have those so that we can see and, and use those as education so we don't have this problem again. If you were thinking that the Civil War remembrance need to be taken down and thrown away with, please take time and go to, to Washington, D.C. and go to the Holocaust Museum. See, putting your head in the sand what could happen if you just try to do away with the history? It's part of history. Use it to teach. Okay, moving along. And here lies the real insidious harm of stolen valor. Now, look at that guy there. You know he didn't want to be out in an electrical storm. Uh, I don't know how he put that coat, that coat on with all that weight. Somebody must have had to dress him. The war stories that these fake vet, uh, vets tell serve to widen this gap. They further the creation of a false perception of what military life is like and what the challenge are that real soldiers face. For every person who pretends to be a hard-charging ranger having killed a dozen enemy with a knife and a pistol while alone behind enemy lines, there are three more who have heard this and believe it. So what happens when the message they are trying to send is that the being an infantryman and having to shoot someone or watch your friend die is no big deal. Let me tell you something. You go out to the airport one day when that casket's coming off that airplane with that flag drove on it, and you see the family, and you tell me stolen valor is no big deal. And those who suffer from post-traumatic stress are a bunch of pussies. 
You got a population that is unaware of the fact that 22 military veterans commit suicide every day because it ain't no big deal. So why not go ahead and claim all these medals and to be uh, a big time war veteran and so forth? Because it ain't no big deal. What happens when you get an individual who claims to have been both an enlisted and commissioned special forces operator and also a military helicopter pilot? You get a public perception that special forces operators are some kind of James Bond types. Now, some of them think they are, uh, of course, uh, who can drive a submarine, fly a plane, play Baccarat, 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 I think it is, okay, and so forth. I mean, James Bond was always playing Baccarat in his, uh, in his tuxedo there. <coughs> Excuse me. You're in a public that has no clue of the enormous divorce, uh, divorce rates in the special operations community due to the incredible stress operations. Uh, Tempo has no idea of the warrior mindset that enables someone to ruck 50 miles through a swamp with leeches all over the body simply to observe a target for a few hours, report in, and ruck 50 miles back out through a swamp without leaving a trace. And that's what the Special Forces guys did. They want a whole lot of glory by going through the swamps, the leeches all over you, no food. You can't even, you can't even, you, you may lay in your own human waste while you're watching to see what's going on because you can't make any noise because there's maybe six or seven of you and there's 500 of them and then come back out. Ain't no big deal though. What difference does it make? The United States, the concept of support for the troops is prevalent. You can be in any state in the country and minus a few obvious wackos, you will not find a single person who disagrees with the concept of, I support the troops. Let me ask you out there, what does that actually mean? What does it mean when you say, I support the troops? Are you at the legislature down there trying to get more for the troops? Are you there for the uh, wounded warrior, uh, wounded warriors at the different military bases um, asking what you can do? How just are you supporting the troops? Are you wearing the ribbon on the back of your car? It says, I support the troops. We appreciate that. But what exactly does it mean? What is that you're you supporting? Despite this overwhelming support in the United States, we also have an overwhelming civilian military divide a knowledge and experience gap in which the vast majority of Americans simply don't know much of anything about the military or other than snippets they get from the news, TV, Hollywood, and games, especially now the video games. There are several reasons for this, the shift from a draft to an all-volunteer uh, military, uh, greater generation access to fictionalized media, greater social tolerance for criticism of the military without reactionary cries of un-American and so forth. Uh, to, even today, when we all support the troops, you still hear a lot of uh, bad, bad-mouthing the military and so forth, uh, and nobody ever calls them un-American. They just kind of let it go. The reason why don't really matter as much as the existence of the gap itself. Let's talk about fake veterans. Why do they use their false stories? They gain attention to themselves? To enhance their resume for public office or jobs? How many politicians out there have claimed to be Vietnam vets? Uh, benefits from the Veterans Administration? Uh, good luck on that. Uh, yeah, well, we're not going to go into that tonight, but uh, anyhow. Uh, monetary benefits? Uh, discounts? Hey, sometimes I wear my hat and they give me a, they give me a freak drink at, uh, at McDonald's or whatever. Uh, personal gratification? Uh, each his own, why they get these, uh, you know, why, why they do it. Now, I love this one. I saw Vietnam on a map once, so I'm pretty much a combat veteran. Uh, you would not believe that it's just people out there like that. Quite often, these fake veterans have read a large number of real veteran stories and know more about the overall war than real veterans. See, when we were in Vietnam, we only saw where we were that day and what we did that day. We didn't see the big picture. But so many of these wannabes, stolen valid people, have read all these books and, and learned a, a vernacular somewhat of, the, of, uh, of a Vietnam vet and some of the things that went on. So even they can fool uh, Vietnam vets sometimes. 
Sometimes their stories are so believable they even fool actual Vietnam veterans for a short time. I am a member of an organization, NCVBI, which is North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated, uh, that holds a monthly commemorative ceremony for those from North Carolina still unaccounted for from the Vietnam War. We've been doing this for over 32 years. There's 38 from North Carolina today who are still unaccounted for. Uh, we have the ceremony and call out their uh, call out their names. But in the process over the last 32 years of uh, being down there as Vietnam vets, we have had some interesting Vietnam veterans come by to see us. One day, a civilian attendee of the ceremony approached me all excited. He had just met a Marine, a POW on top of that. But we introduced the man as a Vietnam Marine POW since we had nothing to go on but his word. He spoke to an enthralled crowd. He told us all, everybody there about his time as a POW and as a Marine and so forth. But before the next ceremony, we had a chance to uh, check him out a little bit. And uh, lo and behold, he was a Vietnam veteran and he served in the Army. He was never a Marine. He was never a POW. But for some reason, he must have been ashamed of his time as being an Army in Vietnam. I don't know what he did. Uh, probably spent time in LBJ, Long Ben Jail, or whatever. But he claimed to be a Marine in the POW. That was his stolen valor. And you can see there's some POWs uh, there at Hanoi Hilton. And this is one of my favorites here. Uh, this young man uh, came to us, and he had on the back of his car, he had a Civil Star, which is the third highest uh, medal that you can get in the military. He had three Purple Hearts. for That means he was wounded in combat. Uh, you, don't get, you don't get a, a paper cut to get those. You have to be wounded in combat, blood. And he got a Bronze Star. Another day at the ceremony, same one before, not, to, not the same day, but another day at the same ceremony, we met a disabled Marine who was a Vietnam veteran who had cancer and other problems. The organization embraced him for what he claimed and even paid his membership dues for him to be a member of NCVI. Excuse me now, I had a sneeze. <laughs> it came anyway. Um, but he, he told us he had a silver star, three purple hearts, and a bronze star. And we introduced him as such until I received the call one day from the Purple Heart Group uh, questioning his claim. In fact, I was on a way to a, a veteran's uh, trip, uh, and I was going through New York during rush hour traffic on the way to Boston for um, uh, a Vietnam veteran's trip there and uh, trying to talk to the Purple Heart guy on the phone and figure out who he was talking about. And he was questioning the claim of the uh, Purple Hearts. So uh, I started to question him a little bit. Uh, to, be, to be a member of NCVI and most veterans organizations, you're required to submit a form that's called a DD-214 form showing the service that most organizations require. Now, I've had people tell me, well, I was in, I, I was in secret. Uh, service there and didn't show up on my DD-214. Listen, if you believe that, I have some oceanfront property in uh, Arizona that I want to sell you uh, because it, your service there in DD-214 is on your DD-214. It may go and not go into detail, but if you were in Vietnam, it's there. Okay. After discovering he had not submitted a copy of his DD-214, I asked him to give me a copy as required. I mean, if you're going to be a member, you're going to have a DD-214. His comment was, we're all friends here. We don't need that kind of stuff. In other words, he didn't want to give us the DD-214. Then a Civil Star recipient in the group did some research and found out he was not on any Civil Star registry. There are a couple of different Civil Star registries. You cannot be on one, but you might be on the other. After doing more research, we discovered that he was, in fact, a Marine, but he was in the Marine band and never left the United States. Now, I've got nothing against the guy because he, he served in the Marines and he was in the band. That's where they assigned him. But don't claim to be a Vietnam veteran with the Civil Star and you never left the United States. He served, did his job, but felt the need to enhance his record for personal gain and prestige and benefits. NCVI had been fooled for a while. No wonder the non-military public gets fooled. So out there, just look at anybody that claims to be a Vietnam vet, uh, even us who are there and have had experience with these people, uh, we get fooled sometimes. Uh, we pushed a guy all over Washington, D.C. in a wheelchair. 
Come to find out he was not a Vietnam vet and he didn't need the wheelchair. He could walk as well, probably better than some of us. But uh, we all we all get fooled from some time. And uh, you can, but there are ways to find out. Now, here's a gentleman uh, in his campaign literature from Calmet, 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 Calumet Park. Uh, Mayor Joseph Dupar touted his decorated service in the United States Army during the Vietnam War. And he says, as a sergeant in the military, I received the Medal of Honor with four bronze stars. Now, I'm not certain if he was saying he received the Medal of Honor and four bronze stars, or if he was trying to say he received the Medal of Honor with four oak leaf stars. See, rather than giving you the same medal over and over again, it might give you a bronze star with two oak leaf clearances, which means you've got you won it twice for my leadership in this campaign flyer states. The Par's military records, which the Tribune obtained from National Archives and Records Administration, do not list the Medal of Honor, the military's highest decoration. Victoria Kuek, director of the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, confirmed DuPar is not a Medal of Honor recipient. We have a small, I only have a small number of living recipients, and there's an archive file on each one since the Civil War, Kuek said. The par declined to show his medals or discuss them. Did he use that to help him get to be the mayor? I don't know. You're to decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. Attorney General Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut found himself in the hot seat. A Times article reported that Mr. Blumenthal, a Democrat running for United States Senate, had not fought in Vietnam, and yet in a speech in 2008, he said, we have learned something important since the days that I served in Vietnam. In fact, he received five military deferments between 1965 and 1970 when he landed a con coveted spot in the, in the Marine Reserves, which allowed him to avoid combat overseas. But he learned something while he was serving in Vietnam. Okay. Now, I love these guys. Uh, not very subtle soul in valor. Uh, uh yeah yeah that that they uh, those guys speak for themselves uh and so forth and uh, uh the air force guy i like to ride in the green with his jeans on and his beret and i i, I can't even tell but I, I can see one or two i can see a couple of purple hearts there and i can't see he's not only got the hanging ribbons but he's got the uh the bars too which is basically one and the same but um yeah and so is the guy the other guy in the middle there uh well, we're not even going to go into what they got and so forth, but quite all. Oh, except for the Air Force guy, uh, he's wearing a CIB. The only person mm -hmm. who qualifies for a CB is an Army guy who is in the infantry. Levin Bravo is MOS, or as we used to call it, Levin Bullet Stopper. That is the only person who qualifies for a CIB. If you were any other MOS or had a, any other job in Vietnam, and you were in combat right beside the 11 Bravo soldier, you did not qualify for the CIB because you were not a official infantryman. But he's wearing one. He also has the airborne wings there, too, I see under that. So uh, it's interesting sometimes to see how these guys are uh, uh, total, total idiots and how they dress. And, but uh, this guy's even got a king. More power to him. I want to. I want all these people out there. Now, this guy, wow, Master Chief. Now, he's claiming to be a Master Chief there, the guy in, 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 the, in the dark there with the sign that says he's wearing a SEAL medallion. And this is what somebody wrote. You, you are currently in 5th or 6th Marine Air Base uh, FOD or qualified, EOD qualified. In, in other words, you were, uh, could take care of bombs and a, and a SEAL. Uh, now I am no expert, but I think those two shoulder uh, go above your jump wings uh, and on and on about that. And then you see the together. I don't always steal Valor, but when I do, I steal a lot of it. Uh, you see his uniform there. Uh, these fakes are easy to recognize, but what about the more subtle fakes? The ones that don't wear all the medals, but tell you about them. The treasurer of fake U.S. Navy vets charity sentenced. Blanca Contreras, the treasurer of a bogus charity that collected millions under the guise of helping military veterans 
was sentenced to five years in prison by an Ohio judge. Blanca Contreras, one of the few real people in an organization of made-up identities that was the United States Navy Veterans Association, siphoned off more than $450,000 of money raised by telephone solicitors working for the group, prosecutors said. And being a fake don't mean nothing, does it? Vet John Anthony Raymond White found guilty of $16 million scam. A man claiming to be a disabled veteran was convicted of ripping off the government for $16 million in federal contracts. The jury concluded he was always a fraud, and he faces up to 75 years in jail and a $3.7 million in fines when sentenced. But being a fake don't make no difference, does it? Fake war hero gets 24 years in prison after frauding women of $255,000. An extensive case of stolen valor and fraud, a man in Minnesota now faces a heavy prison sentence. Derek Milan Aldred, 47, was sentenced by a federal court to 24 years in prison after he pled guilty to mail fraud and aggravated identity fraud. CARE 11 News, 11 News reported. Along with the prison sentence, Aldred is ordered to pay. $255,000 in restitution. Kansas City, Kansas. The owner of a Missouri construction company is sentenced to 87 months in federal prison for defrauding a federal government program that set aside contracts for businesses owned by service disabled veterans. Warren K. Parker, 70, Blue Springs, Missouri, pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit fraud against the United States one count of major program fraud, one count of wire fraud, and one count of money laundering, and one count of making false statements. In his plea, Park admitted he falsely claimed to be a service-disabled veteran and a war hero in order to retain more than $6.7 million in contracts in the Veterans Administration and more than $748,000 in contracts from the Department of Defense. The contracts are awarded under the Service Disabled Veterans' Own Small Business Program. You would think somebody would check, but I don't know. I give it that they didn't. After an extensive investigation, federal agents determined that Parker and his company, Civil Star, Civil Star Construction, that's why they didn't check. He had a Civil Star, a, li a, li a limited license corporation of Blue Springs, Missouri, and Stillwell, Kansas, fraudly claimed self uh, service disabled veteran owned small business status in order to obtain federal government contracts. In fact, Parker never was classified as a service-disabled veteran by the Veterans Administration or the Department of Defense. In March 2011, Parker submitted a fraudulent resume in which he manufactured history as a war hero, including a record of service in Vietnam, claimed he was awarded three Silver Stars, three Purple Hearts, and other citations. State and federal records show that Parker served in the Missouri National Guard from 1963 to 1968. He spent six months on active duty. He could have got all those medals in six months on, on active duty. In 1968, he was honorably discharged as a senior engineer equipment with the rank of specialist E5. Now, this is one that out there that got really interesting here. Army investigators warned public about romance scams. These are going, these are very prevalent today. Special agents from the U.S. Army Civil Inve uh, Investigation Command, uh, the CID, coming known as CID are once again warning internet users worldwide about cyber criminals involved in the online crime that CID has dubbed the romance scam. CID, CID special agents continue to receive numerous reports from victims located around the world regarding various scams of persons impersonating U.S. soldiers online. Victims are usually unsuspecting women 30 to 55 years old who believe they are romantically involved with an American soldier yet are being exploited and ultimately who strike from thousands of miles away. We cannot stress enough that people need to stop sending money to persons they meet on the Internet and claim to be the United States military. In the United States military, said Chris Gray, Army CID spokesman. It is very troubling to hear these stories over and over again of people who have sent thousands of dollars to someone they have never met and sometimes have never even spoken to on the phone, Gray said. The majority of the romance scams are being perpetrated on social media and dating type websites where unsuspecting females are the main target. The criminals are pretending to be U.S. servicemen routinely serving in a combat zone. 
The perpetrators will often take the true rank and name of a U.S. soldier who is honorably serving his country somewhere in the world, where he has previously served and been honorably discharged. Then marry, uh, marry that up to with some photographs of a soldier off the Internet, which you can get any anytime, and they build a false identity to begin prowling the Internet for victims. The scams often involve careful worded romantic requests for money from the victim to purchase special laptop computers, international telephones, military leave papers, didn't know you could purchase those, and transportation fees to be used by the uh, facetious, fictitious deployed soldiers so their false relationships can continue. The scams including ask the victim to send money, often thousands of dollars at a time to a third party address. When the victims are hooked, the criminals continue their ruse. We've even seen instances where the perpetrators are asking victims for money to purchase leave papers from the army, help pay for medical expenses from combat wounds, or help pay for their flight home so they can leave their war zone, said Gray. Now, this is the new one. Uh, this is another one. Our friend at Green Beret uh, Poser uh, exposed us. The Green Beret Posers is a website you can go to if you have someone claiming to be a Vietnam vet. Send us their work on this fellow. Alex Vanderheide, an amazing story of deceit and lies. Well, I'm going to let them tell you about it. We first uh, we present First Sergeant Arnott Alexander Vanderheide, retired, who claims to be a Special Forces Sergeant assigned to USASOC. Special Operations Center, United States Army Special Operations Center, he has made claims of being assigned to the 1st to the 10th Special Forces in Bad Tolex, Germany, 1st to the 7th Special Forces Group at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 3rd to the 7th Special Forces Group in Panama, and insinuated he served in uh, Special Forces OD, uh, not certain what that is. So we attempted to verify his service with a group of about 4,500 Special Forces soldiers, and not one had any knowledge of Van der Heide. On his entry into Vet Friends website, uh, which is a vet site you can go in and help uh, find some friends in Viet that you were with in Vietnam, Van der Hyde claims that to have served from 1997 to 2014. Listed his rank as First Sergeant E8. He claims USAOC, uh, United States Army Special Operations Center, as his unit. Many of the photos in his book show Vanderbilt in military uniforms and VFW garb displaying all of his unearned awards, decorations, and badges. And most VFWs do check that DD-214. Like so many posers, Van der Howe was able to join the Veterans of Foreign Wars serving in uh, Post-1142. I spoke to the commander of VFW Post-1142, located in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. He stated that Vanderbilt was no longer a member of that post. I all spoke with the commander of North Carolina VFW District 15. He told me that Van der Howe had been accepted into the VFW Post 7034 in Sparta, North Carolina, which is a very small town. I have been unable to ascertain how Vanderbilt was verified for membership in the VFW. The District 15 commander also verified that Vanderhyde is on the North Carolina VFW color guard and serves as state recruiter for the VFW. Pretty good for someone who never served in the military. And that's a copy of a DD-214 there uh, and so forth. So, You see Vanderhyde's need to spill self-important. There he is standing in his VFW uniform, color guard, with the uh, former governor of North Carolina, uh, McClory. Uh, he takes photos with politicians, celebrities, as part of his duty as a member of the North Carolina VFW color guard. The photo of Van, de, of Van de Hyde in his Class A dress greens make it hard to view all the badges, decorations, award, but one can make out the ribbons of the Distinguished Service Medal, which is the second highest, uh, the, Silver, uh, the Silver Star Medal, the Purple Heart Medal, the Combat Infantryman's Badge, Master Parachutist, Parachutist Badge, Master Military Freefall Badge, Combat Divers Badge, Special Forces Tab, and Ranger Tab. Man, that man is well trained. Our next step was to request Van der Heide's military records under the auspices of the Freedom of Information Act from the National Personnel Records Center. Uh, we soon had our answers, and there is no record of Van der Heide ever having served in the military. On February 28, 2017, I spoke with Van der Hyde. I identified myself as a retired Special Forces officer, and I wanted to discuss his service. I asked him about the information on his vet friend's account, which stated he had served from 1997 to 2014 and listed his rank as First Sergeant E-8, assigned to United States Army Special Operations Center. As often the case, he denied that was him. 
So I told him I had requested his military records under the Freedom of Information Act from the National Personnel Records Center, and, it had re- and they had, respond- had been response in my hand. I then told him his date of birth and his last four with Social Security number and asked if that was his correct information. He verified it was correct. I told him there was no record of his ever serving in the military, and also I had a photo of him in an Army dress green uniform wearing as a minimum the Civil Star, the Purple Heart, the Combat Infantryman Badge, Master Parachutist Badge, Master Military Freefall Parachutist Badge, Combat Divers Badge, Special Forces Tab, Ranger Tab, and United States Army Special Operations Center Unit Patch. I asked him again, and he admitted to the lie, saying he made a big mistake. <laughs> I also bought up the Stolen Valor Act of 2013 and is receiving a $50,000 scholarship from the University of Phoenix in country music television. So he never served, let alone earn anything he displayed on his uniform. Now, folks, I'm, we're I'm going to end the show here. I've got some other parts that I'm going to show you, but I'm going to do that the next show. Uh, I hope you got some information and enjoyed the show. Uh, some of the uh, stolen violets, some of them are, if they weren't so ridiculous, they'd be laughable. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight as we uh, talk about wannabes and stolen violets. Uh, as I said, I hope you found some perspective on the uh, Vietnam War and those who served. Please tell your friends about our show. Our next live Lessons of Vietnam show uh, will be 27th of February. Now, you can go back on anytime you want to uh, to uh, Neeson Communications and check on uh, demand and see any of the past shows that are out there. And uh, I know you'll uh, like to go back and see some of them. We hope you and yours have a wonderful, wonderful Valentine's Day tomorrow. And again, thank you for showing, uh, showing, uh, watching the show and have a, like I said, uh, give your loved one a nice uh, box of candy for me. And if they don't want it, just let them send it to me. I'll, I'll eat it because uh, I got to go on a diet after, after I get through with this. So uh, thank you all very much and good evening. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.